Greetings, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Greetings from Javan Jyoti Ashram on this 33rd Sunday of Ordinary Time. Thank you for joining me yet again as we do each Sunday, sitting at the feet of our Lord as Father, Son, and Spirit, listening to him speaking to us through the Sunday Mass readings and my reflections on these readings. My reflection this Sunday is entitled Hope for a Better Tomorrow. And the context in which I base my reflection is Hope Amid Adversity. The apocalyptic literature and the fulfillment of these writings offer to all humankind hope for a better tomorrow. The first reading, Daniel 12, 1 to 3, introduces Daniel, a Jewish hero who is not the author. He was taken as a young man into exile in Babylon. As a practical consideration, this book presents writing that is more so apocalyptic rather than prophetic. Apocalyptic writing originated subsequent to the prophetic writings, though the latter influenced apocalyptic writing because an element of some prophetic writings was looking towards the future. The physical setting for this writing is that of Syrian occupation of Israel under the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who tried to impose Greek culture, institutions, language, and religion on the Jewish people, which would eventually lead to the wars of the Maccabees. This writing was meant to inspire hope amid the persecutions the Jews suffered, in that its overall message is that one does not have to conform to what one does not believe in in order to survive secular life, because God delivers and honors those who face temptation and hardship for his sake. And as a little testimony to this in my own personal life. In the places where I have worked, and even in my own personal life, my own family life, you have that struggle of secular versus your religion, what you believe in, your faith. In places where I have worked, I would put religious objects and pictures around my computer and my desk. And sometimes people will be offended. They will say things, you'll make fun of me. Like I have an altar on my desk. Oh, I think these things are gonna give me protection. But I was never ashamed. All of my colleagues were not really walking. I don't know any colleague that I had ever worked with who was really walking with the Lord, who was following a particular religion. And so I would take the ridicule. Even when things came my way, like God blessings that people could understand in the office, they would attribute it to me working black magic, not prayers. My prayers were not giving me blessings. It had to be black magic because I didn't believe in the power of prayer. And in people's faith, even though my faith was demonstrated, not just by the objects around me in my physical surroundings, but also by my faith, by the, the stories I would share with friends of what God was doing in my life and the life of my family members. But as a, another part of that testimony is living even within family and among friends, even people who do go to church. They would come to our home and see just religious pictures on the walls. You know, there are no major pictures of families, there are no pictures of places that I've visited. There may be um, souvenirs, some countries, but no pictures really. All of our pictures, all of the things that we use to decorate our house are religious. I've even had priests laugh when they come and see you have a church here, you don't have a house, you have a church, you have a chapel. Many people make fun of us in that sense, my husband and I. But it is not that we have to show off our faith, but as far as we can see, this is what makes us happy, being surrounded, seeing the people that we love, the saints, 
God the Father, the Son, the Spirit, our Blessed Mother Mary, seeing pictures of them, images of them, statues, knowing these are memories or memoirs that give us the memory of the people that we love. They're also sacramentals, some of these things. But we hold on to them because of the memory it gives us of who we are, who we belong to, who is our family in heaven. This is our final and ultimate destiny to be reunited with this family because at some point we were all together as God conceived us. At that moment of conception in his mind, we all gave him that same place of his conception. So we will be, we'll be united in heaven and we hold close that family in heaven. Not that we don't appreciate the family God gave us on earth, but we live for that ultimate union with the entire family of humanity in heaven. And so we have had to explain ourselves as to why our house looks the way it does, or why we may not go to, to parties, why we don't have alcohol in our house, except for baking, because I bake a lot. And I use that for alcohol and baking for flavor, not for intoxication. Even at our wedding, my husband and I did not have any alcohol because we said we do not drink alcohol, we're not going to serve alcohol, we don't have to get drunk at our weddings. My husband have never had alcohol in his life. And I have testified to you before in my Philip Bush encounters that I used to drink a lot. I, don't, I was not an alcoholic, but I drank a lot and I love alcohol. It could have easily become an addiction. So, we choose, we choose not to go to places where people are just having social gatherings. When we go out, it's the, the homes of people who we believe are like us. They have a relationship with the Lord. They are living a life, a life who are living in the spirit. It doesn't mean we don't have friends who are not believers friends who are not practicing any religion, we do. But we try to avoid putting ourselves in situations where we'll be exposed to the things we do not believe in, the music, the drinking, maybe even people may be doing drugs, we don't know. But whatever it is, we, we keep ourselves open to keep them in places, even though they may not be believers, even though they may not be practicing any religion, not even, or may not even be Catholic, we may go to their houses if they live a life that is not reflecting obvious sin. They're living pretty normal lives and trying their best to be good people regardless of what they believe in. So this has been my life, my life especially since I got married, trying to come to terms with people who don't understand how my husband and I live. That we try as much as we can to always be in the spirit, always moving, working. Even when we're enjoying life, we're doing it in the spirit. That the spirit must always be happy to be where we are, just as much as we are very happy to always be where we know the spirit is working where he's visible. In this first reading, the writings about Daniel offers hope that God is there to help those who suffer, whether in this life or in the life to come. Daniel heard the Lord saying to him, at that time there shall arise Michael, the great prince, guardian of your people, it shall be a time unsurpassed in distress since nations began until that time. At that time, your people shall escape everyone who is found written in the book. This is a promise of deliverance for those who are suffering. God is sending Michael the Archangel to do battle on earth to defend and to save the lives of the Jewish people, but also all in need 
at any time and in any place. And this is a practical application of understanding how we see Michael coming to defend God's people. You know, there's no situation where hope does not abound. And this could apply not just to when we suffer physically, whether it's persecution, abuse, there may be physical sufferings of hunger, a lack of need for something, maybe love, suffering from loneliness. There's also that, 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 that suffering of spiritual dryness. Now, coming from the country of Trinidad, the way I was born, and coming from a parish that was very lively, and now I look back on it in hindsight, very charismatic. The way we worship is very, very charismatic, very open to other people's religion, never condemning religions, very open and very um, exuberant in the way we celebrated the Mass, singing, um, raising hands, clapping, not that much clapping, but we would always be excited at Mass. The music ministry was beautiful. A lot of youth in the ministry. We just celebrated Diwali um, in Trinidad and Tobago and around the world this past week. And I distinctly remember growing up as a young person, as a teenager, when it was Diwali. I went to Mass that Saturday evening and the church was totally in darkness. And I was surprised because the lights are always on, obviously, because the Mass is about to start. The Mass started that Saturday in darkness. And then the priest, with the help of the lay people, lit dias, which is what the lights that the Hindus use for the Wali Abhol. They lit dias and put it all around the altar and all around the, the church in different parts. And the priest said, today we are in unity with our brothers and sisters of the Hindu faith. We are celebrating the Wali light over darkness, good over evil. This is the kind of parish that I was used to. I came to Florida and I joined San Isidro Parish, another very charismatic parish where we had monthly revivals, we had annual um, conferences, charismatic conferences. We had monthly healing masses, every Sunday at mass, I should say every Saturday and Sunday, wherever we celebrated the Sunday Mass. After every Mass, there was an altar call, an anointing for anyone who went up to the anointed. A parish that was on fire for the Holy Spirit. When I got married and I moved away from the parish, and the priest who was actually the pastor, he was also moved, he also moved on from that parish. I came to a time of spiritual dryness, a period of suffering, spiritual suffering, that did not have anything to give me spiritual feeling as I was getting at that parish. So at this time, I had just, my only place of spiritual feeling was the Blessed Sacrament, of course, the best place sitting with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, learning from the Master himself. That became my, my source. So there's hope. There's hope when we suffer, even when it's spiritual dryness. God has something better for us. When we go through that spiritual dryness, God is up to something. He's preparing us to understand him, to get to know him, to grow in relationship with him in a different way. Hope is also, also there for those who have already died. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some shall live forever. We read that in the reading. However, we also read, others shall be an everlasting horror and disgrace. The notion of God's predestination, salvation for some, those who choose to believe, and damnation for others, those who reject God's mercy, is thus incorporated in this writing. 
as the gospel reading Mark 13, 24 to 32 begins, one can apply the literary device of dramatic irony to connect it with the first reading. Dramatic irony occurs when a narrator or character in a story perceives less than the reader does. The readers of this reflection know what was previously written about the persecutions of the Jews, of the coming of Michael to help them in their struggles, and of the hope offered to both the living and the dead. In this reading, Jesus is speaking using the similar apocalyptic language that was used by Daniel when he says, in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. As a practical consideration, Jesus is describing a time of tribulation, which is also the social context of the first reading. And Jesus is also offering hope, the coming of the Son of Man, just as the story of Daniel does. As another aspect of dramatic irony, the reader knows that the promise of the deliverance and of eternal rest rests on the salvific work of Jesus himself, the Son of Man, of whom Jesus speaks. In the Gospel reading, there's yet another aspect of dramatic irony in that the reader knows that the quotation Jesus uses, the Son of Man, coming in the clouds comes from the book of Daniel 7.13. As a practical consideration, as well, the reader knows that Jesus is the Son of Man about whom Daniel had this prophetic vision. Use of the image of the Son of Man coming in the clouds is symbolic in that the cloud symbolizes Jesus' divinity. Jesus comes in his divine capacity, that is, in power and glory. While both the Jews at the time of Daniel's writing and the Jews at the time Jesus speaks were suffering in different physical contexts, and for the most part, in the similar ways, their hope lay in one person the Son of Man, Jesus. In the Gospel reading, as a final aspect of dramatic irony, the reader knows that Daniel mentioned the coming of Michael, the archangel, to do battle on earth for God's people against the tyranny they faced. The reader thus sees the connection between the first reading and the Gospel reading when Mark writes that Jesus says, then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds. As a practical consideration, the reader can identify that what Daniel shared in his apocalyptic writing is confirmed by the words of Jesus himself. That Jesus, in his divinity, commands an army of angels whom Jesus can use at his disposal on earth when needed. As a practical consideration, the reader can identify that what Daniel shared in his apocalyptic writing is confirmed by the words of Jesus himself, that Jesus in his divinity commands an army of angels whom Jesus can use at his disposal on earth when needed. As a practical application, life itself is a dramatic irony. God stands outside of our lived experiences, that is, outside of our story. And he knows our story better than we do. He knows how it will climax and how it will end, just as much as he knew when it began and how it unfolded to this day. 
we can fool ourselves into desiring and planning for the life that we want. But God is the master writer who is developing our story so it will take shape as he creates. He only needs our cooperation as actors who are willing to go along with the script he provides, trusting that the individual part he developed for each of us is best suited for the persons we are. The second reading, Hebrews 10, 11 to 14 and 18, continues reiterating, as has been shared in the previous Sunday's Mass readings, the notion of Jesus' divinity by recounting Jesus' role as high priest in heaven. In this reading, Jesus is compared again, as he was in those Mass readings, with the Levitical priests who, regardless of the actual manner and the quantity of the offerings that were made, can never take away sins. However, one man, Jesus, offered one sacrifice for sins, and this secured Jesus an everlasting place at God's right hand, where Jesus awaits the outcome of his work. Additionally, by one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being consecrated. And Jesus won the gift of salvation for all who accept this gift. Moreover, Jesus took his seat forever at the right hand of God, which highlights Jesus' power position. Jesus shares power with his Father. As a practical application, Jesus is hope for all humankind because Jesus' divinity is a guarantee of his power to save humankind in temporal situations as well as when the time on earth ends. That is their time of personal eschatology. I leave you with this prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the hope I have in your son, Jesus. May I never lose hope despite the circumstances I may face in life. Amen. And remember that God loves you dearly. No matter what suffering you may be experiencing, it is for his own purpose, the purpose that he has destined for you, that he causes the suffering so that you can achieve and fulfill that purpose for your life, his purpose for your life. It may be difficult. Everyone suffers differently. But in the end, God works all things for the good. And he will work all of your sufferings, all of our sufferings for the good. May God bless you abundantly this week. Amen.